Um, okay, so uh, it's Rob and Amy talking about uh, the Jarecki Islands. When we last left off, uh, we were, uh, this came up with the story of uh, Dr. Arnold Friedman, who was a teacher of uh, me and Howie, but not Amy, out in Queens uh, back in the 80s. Uh, he was a teacher at Bayside High School. He later got convicted as the worst, most heinous child molester in Long Island history. So that became the uh, subject of an Oscar-nominated documentary called Capturing the Freedmen's. And what we were discussing last time, this was a couple of weeks ago, was that uh, capturing the Freedmen's does not go into the subject of Arnold Friedman's uh, work at Bayside High School, which was a television studio, among other things. All right, so uh, to cut a long story short, the... Uh, um, the documentary just leaves out a lot of stuff, and and it and it its its basic th thesis is that um, that Arnold Friedman might have been innocent, and that his son probably was innocent. Uh, and you know the students at the high school were never contacted in the making of the film, and we we were never molested by him as far as we know, but nobody asked. And um, the um, Theories that most people thought that you know if he was convicted by a jury he probably was guilty and there was enough there from our personal experiences with him that we all kind of bought the prosecutor's story. But and, did he have that feeling to him that vibe? Well, we discussed it in the last video. Uh, you know, we we, had, we we brought I brought up uh, the, the subject of the mad screamer. And um, we, uh, it was just the way the class was conducted. That, that's not the subject of this talk. We're moving forward, but we could go back or we could talk about more about the school experience later. But it, it, you know, it, it occurred to me that the documentary, by whitewashing the case, right, there might be more to the connection between the family of the producer of that film and Arnie himself. That was one of the main takeaways is that this was the only teacher any of us ever knew of who had his students call him Arnie as opposed to Dr. Friedman or Mr. Friedman. He would have been called Dr. Friedman, but no no one called him Dr. Friedman. It was Arnie. All right, uh, it was an unusual class. But he was also a guidance counselor or a dean, like a guidance counselor. So he, he had right. access to the most vulnerable students and knew their most intimate uh, problems in that role. And he was also uh, nuclear science, which would bring us back to uh, any possible Epstein connection. And there is an Epstein connection to all this. So um, he's not really in any department. So he somehow had these dis different roles in the high school that didn't belong to any particular department like English or science or uh, you know, right. math. Or they had departments <clears throat> and chairmen. And I mean, by calling a first name and like having it all like that, those could be indicators of pedophilic behavior, like grooming and stuff. Right, and where did this come from? Arnie, you know, it's probably he got that when he was a child, so he might have been molested as a child. So we don't know anything. All molesters have been molested as children. So we don't know uh, anything about his early life, even in this documentary. They don't explore the high school career, and they don't explore his early life. They explore his children. So the uh, producer was a person named Andrew Jarecki, and uh, he, um, he made a few films, but not too many. But he has three other brothers, some of them are also in film and their father is a billionaire named Henry Jarecki okay it turns out that both uh, Andrew Jarecki the producer of Capturing the Freedmen's and his father billionaire Henry Jarecki are in Epstein's Little Black Book Really. and uh, Henry Jarecki has wow. flown on the Lolita Express he's in the flight log and okay. And the family, or at least the father, but you could assume the family, owns two islands in the British Virgin Islands, uh, not too far from Epstein Island, 
So um, okay. um, I'm going to um, produce a map. Uh, if you're in front of a computer, um, it's interesting. You can't easily find a map of the entire Virgin Islands. You usually either find one side or the other, the American or the British side. But if you go to Guana Island, as in Iguana, Guana Island is one of the islands that the Jerekis own, you'll find a f complete map, uh, public domain artwork of, of the whole Virgin Islands. Uh, so you can see everything all together because Epstein's on the American side and the Jerekis are on the British side So you wouldn't really see the proximity unless you could like step back and look at the whole thing Okay. <clears throat> so I'm just gonna yeah, that's Interesting like if he's like the director is connected the director of the movie is connected to Epstein Island And then you were saying maybe Arnie's not guilty what it could be is he's a pedophile and he really did that and for so, I mean, this is just speculation out of nowhere. I don't even have a lot of information, but um, maybe it's, um, you know, he, they knew he was a pedophile, and that was true, and that for, and he was, like, involved in the cult in some way, and he didn't want to do what they wanted him to do, and that could have been their revenge to expose him to the pedophilia. Well, it's, an idea. It's, it's just, it would be a standard line of inquiry if you were investigating this guy to go to the high school now the, the remember the um the documentary didn't come out until way after the conviction i think after you know the father died uh, in jail <clears throat> so you know the the film actually came out as the son who was also convicted the freedman's son josh was getting out of prison and in fact Andrew oh, same thing, uh, child molest. Oh, well. Okay. <clears throat> I'm not going to go into the details of the case because it would take too long. So, right, know, right, right. this is, just, this gotcha. is just a stub going forward to the islands, bringing the, just saying that there's a connection uh, of the uh, Friedman case via the Jarecki's to the Virgin Islands and directly to Jeffrey Epstein that Andrew yeah. Jarecki had donated money while he was producing this film, uh, contributed money towards uh, Josh Friedman's release. And uh, so he was, wasn't was just a, uh, an impartial uh, film documentarian, he was trying to get this son out of jail. He, he had a bias, he thought he was innocent or uh, another way was, or in some sense was trying to help him. And, um, uh, the Freedman sons had given Jarecki exclusive access to all these videotapes they had, right, of the family during the time of the uh, trial. So these kids were filming the family at the dinner table and around the house. They were filming their father and showing him, documenting him as he was going through this, you know, his life falling apart. And that's, that's very odd. And that's what's in capturing the Freemans. But considering how video oriented the entire family was, and that uh, Arnie ran a television studio in a high school, uh, you know, the issue of child pornography comes up. That's what I'm thinking. That's, so that's, you read my mind. That's exactly what I was thinking. Like, wait a minute, you know. Okay, so we have yeah. a billionaire family taking a keen interest in the case of Arnold Friedman, who no one would have ever heard of, all right, for some reason, and making a film about it that whitewashes the case, right? And they own, yeah. uh, they own, yeah. they own two islands in the uh, Caribbean, right near Epstein Island. One is, and they're on the British side, so they're, although they're very close, they're just as close as Water Island, which was uh, partially owned by the Biden family, all right? Um, <laughs> So one is called Guana Island. It's uninhabited, but it has a resort and, and a nature preserve. And it's on the north, uh, and um, it's, it's to the north of Tortugo. Okay, so in the, in the Virgin Islands as a whole, there are three bigger islands. They go from left to right. I think it's St. Thomas, St. John, and then over the border is Tortuga. It's, it, those are the large islands. And then there are all these smaller private islands all over the place they're dotted all over there's quite there's quite a few of them um and then they have caves which are little islets or you know you would call them in florida keys or caves these little uh, things that are just 
too small to build on. Uh, but Guana Island, if you look at a picture of it, 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 it's basically like a big mountain, so it would be easy to tunnel into, but it's a nature preserve and it has a resort. And if you just go off to the east a little bit, out on the tip there, that's where Necker Island is, which is where Richard Branson has his little compound. So he's so okay. so Guana Island, and it's it doesn't mean poop bird poop. It means iguana. Um, it um, it's next door neighbors pretty much to um, Branson's Island. Okay, so it occurs to me if you were going to have one of those hunting parties, you know, like yeah, I've been to those. Like as a child, I I have memories of I was in the woods naked. Right. Being hunted. I remember that. So if you're going to have a, yeah. a hunting party, like you know, like Fiona, like like you describe, and Fiona Bar Barnett in Australia describes, and there are other uh, descriptions, um, I think in England, or definitely like like uh, some far. Yeah, very faint memories of it. It's just a memory that that happened. Very little detail, but okay. yeah. But if a lot you of were going to have a hunting shit. party, right? Then um, that would be a perfect place to do it. Would be. Guana Island, a nature preserve that's privately owned by a billionaire with only a resort. Of course, yeah. And if you were somehow to swim away from that island, if you didn't get back to Tortuga, the only other place you would wash up would be Branson's Island, Necker Island. It's right next door. So Richard Branson right. would right. pull you off the beach and say, oh, you poor thing, in his charming accent, and then fly you right back <laughs> to where you came from. Right, so there's, there's, it's all, they're all together. They're, it's all concentrated, and there's no, no one to catch, catch anything. Yeah. Right. Now, when you look at this map of the Virgin Islands, what you don't see on the edge of, on, uh, beyond the edges of that map are all these other um, Antilles and islands going south, and then also the Bahamas going north, and then Puerto Rico and Haiti and the Dominican Republic and uh, off to the west. So there are a bunch of islands all around here. So it's not just the Virgin okay. Islands. So it's all a matter of perspective. So there's a lot of celebrities. If you look at private owned islands by celebrities, there's a ton of them in the Bahamas, including um, that one little um, scoundrel, um, uh, Nygaard. I forgot his first name. Was it Thomas Nygaard? He was one of those never even heard of him. fashion billionaires who, 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 you know, who got. He wasn't arrested yet, but he had to step down. He had some kind of. His name is Nygaard, N Y G A R D, which is dragon spelled backwards. Um, oh yeah. So this guy was a real pig. He was worse than like. Uh, I I can't say he was worse than Epstein, but uh, definitely on par. He, was, he just operated off this island uh, in the Bahamas, and there's a lot of celebrities in the Bahamas who are owning these little islands. Uh, I don't right, have the list right. offhand, and that's not the purpose of this uh, this this podcast. So the second island that the Jarekis own is more to the south, right? And uh, mm -hmm. so it's on the other side of Tortuga, to the south, and it's called Norman Island. And this is also a very interesting place. It's also uninhabited. It has a restaurant, and they are developing. It's probably already developed, but we just don't have the news yet. But they're developing a resort down there as well. And Norman Island is also known as Treasure Island. It is the, the island that is the uh, inspiration for Robert Louis Stevenson's book, Treasure Island. I was just thinking that as it connected. That. Yeah, okay. It is that island, yeah. And there's all Got kinds it. of buried treasure. There's all kinds of stories of pirates and buried treasure and sunken ships all around that place. And uh, that that kind of um, speculation is encouraged by the British Virgin Islands to attract tourists. Right. Okay. Now you'll find Epstein's um, Greater and Little St. James Islands are in between. Uh, St. Thomas and St. John. So right where those two islands meet, if you look to the south, you could actually see them. Um, <clears throat> so um, now it's when you look at the Jarecki family and they're billionaires and, and you look at the story of Henry Jarecki was a uh, 
doctor of psychiatry at Yale, and he taught psychiatry oh, at Yale. Oh, goodness. It's all there, yep. But he became a, uh, a commodities trader in precious metal, and that's where he got his money. And uh, it turns out that, like, they're connected to another... They're Jewish, as was Epstein and the Maxwells, right? I'm going to say that in quotes, Jewish, because, you know, it, it, you know, some of these families appear to be Luciferian, not really Jewish. And then, well, yeah, my family is supposedly Jewish, but we're Luciferian. Well, not me, but they were Luciferian, yeah. So the, um, uh, Andrew Derecki made, he didn't make too many movies, but he made another pretty well-known movie called The Jinx. And The Jinx is about a billionaire's son named Robert Durst. And it appears that the Durst family and the Jarecki family knew each other and grew up together, kind of associated with each other. And Robert Durst had all these people associated with him who turned up dead. And Durst was claiming it was a coincidence. And Andrew Jarecki had access to Robert Durst and was making a documentary called The Jinx and somehow managed to record Robert Durst confessing to, one, to, all, to, to all the murders. Wow. So if you look into the Robert Durst case, it's, it's, it happened a while ago, and he's in jail, right? But, but it's funny because you know, the Jarecki family has four sons, and, and the Durst family, I think, has three or four sons. All right? Now, what are the odds of having four sons? Just statistically. Uh, well, the um, let's see, one and two, one and four, one and eight, one and sixteen, I think, right? I don't right, know. So it's like each one would be one and two, and then so it's like, yes, well, I think it's one and sixteen. <laughs> it just doesn't come up too often. Anyways, um, this Robert Durst. Um, I forgot, I think it was a girl, some girlfriend wound up being dismembered, and eventually it turned out he did it, and then he, he claimed that she died accidentally, and then he panicked and just sawed her into pieces and tried to throw her in the bay. And I, at the time, I, I had seen this movie, The Jinx, and it didn't make sense to me. I'm like, well, if you panic, right, because someone's dead... That doesn't follow that you would dismember the body. You would. Yeah, like you'd have to be pretty deranged to be doing that. So something's wrong there. You wouldn't. Nobody would do that. Like. Yeah, you, you would know? just dump it somewhere. But because that's all he did was he took it in these garbage bags, the remains, and dumped it in like basically the nearest. Yeah, you just dump it. You wouldn't cut it up like that. That shows right. a level of I mean, something fucked up in your brain. Yeah. You know? Well, not just fucked up. That you had to know how to do it. You know, I don't or think... Even he, more I, so, thank you, yes. I, I don't think it's, like, easy to do. I, I think you have to have some experience and, so, you know, you had to have done it before, right? Which... It, right. So I started thinking maybe the Jarecki family, right, and the Durst family are both these Luciferian intergenerational satanic pedo families that's that's the working hypothesis is that maybe these people are part of that whole that whole uh network <coughs> and they were using arnold friedman to produce child porn or provide child porn or maybe even produce child porn with their own sons right and what they yeah. did was you know the, what the, the you know things got out of hand with the dead bodies and they decided to pin it on Robert Durst the the one of the sons they decided to just throw away one son and the, you know this was the, because the way it happened was like he was interviewing Robert Durst Andrew Jarecki had him in like this dining room and he had him wired up with a wireless microphone and the guy went to take a, a bathroom break right and he was in, in the bathroom washing his hands, talking to himself, looking in the mirror and saying, I killed them all. Uh, okay. And that was used as evidence to convict him. But, you know, I don't think if you wired, if you wired up, I think it was like the, 
I don't know what it was like. It was either the late 90s, but still. You got a little box with a transmitter. You know how the microphone works. You know, you would know it was still recording. Or you would at least know you were wired. You're wearing, you know, like a, a professional wireless microphone. It's this whole thing. It's in your shirt. There's a little trans box that's attached to you. So it's not like he forgot. You know, it's almost like almost he was programmed in a way or it just doesn't Something, make sense like some sort of we yeah it doesn't really add up the whole thing like why would somebody do that yeah so it doesn't make sense uh, in hindsight when you look at all this stuff knowing what we know now especially about the islands at the time all this happened no one would have known about the islands no one would have looked at these islands that Jarecki owns but now with the Epstein's now you know so the Jarecki's are in Epstein's black book the Jarecki kids seem to have known the Maxwells okay which is another Jewish family and then the Dursts and um, there's um, and the Bronfman so this is the, the you know the the Bronfmans come up. You, you you could find references of them attending the same parties and stuff. but basically all these billionaire Jewish families in the New York metropolitan area were at the very least acquainted with each other, right? But like right. Year, decades later, they all wind up caught up in these same types of scandals involving satanic or you know or or um, cult like pedo rings. So, and then I'm, yeah, and then yeah I'm, they're, all con they're all connected to each other. I mean, that's how it was in the cult. When I was a child, like, you know, everyone's connected. It's all, you're, you, it's like you know who's in it, and you know, you know what I mean? Like, like the people, not me, I was a child, but the adults in it who were wanting to be there, it's all connected, absolutely. Okay, so, so these, um, and then a lot of these patriarchs who became the billionaires for all this money, and these families, they come from places like Germany, that's where they're born, or um, if you look at Soros, he's coming from, I think, Belarus, is it? Um, they just come from we weird places, and I'm like, I'm starting to see that they're not Jewish, they're, uh, they're paperclip. They're, they're Nazi paperclip, and they come over, disguise as Jews, become billionaire, and then they're saying, oh, don't look at us, we're just poor Jews that came from the Holocaust. Don't, oh, you have to feel sorry I for see. us. Don't, you oh, know, wow. Even though we have billions of dollars and we peddle children, and that they didn't become billionaires by trading gold or this, that, or the other thing, whatever they said they did. They became billionaires by trading slaves and children. Yeah. Yeah, human trafficking, yeah. And that's yeah. probably the only way you can actually become a billionaire. And well, then I mean, you like, use these islands. There are other ways, but for the most part, yeah. So there's a submarine base beneath Water Island. I've actually found pictures of it now, of the entrance. And now Water Island is off the, uh, the coast of, I, I think, St. John. So it's a little further away from Epstein Island, but just as far uh, as the others are to the east. Um, so it's, it's you're talking 10 miles. I, you know, I, I think the whole Virgin Islands is probably only 100 or not more than 100 miles across or whatever it is. So it's almost like, you know, if you have little planes, you can really get from one island to the next in 5 or 10 minutes. So, right, right. Yeah, it's quick inter-travel. Yeah, absolutely. So if this is some yeah. kind of trafficking ring running out of one or more of the islands, and it's not just going among the Virgin Islands, but also the Bahamas, so it's just a half-hour flight to the Bahamas, it's just a half-hour flight to Puerto Rico, maybe a little longer to even Cuba or um, Dominican Republic and Haiti. Because that's what uh, Isaac Cappy said in his song, Brackets and Jackets. He says it's suspiciously close to Haiti. Right? And then when you go... Oh, Haiti goes into the whole Clinton Foundation and then all that trafficking and oh my goodness, yeah. When you go south um, of uh, the Virgin Islands, it just goes all the way down to South America. There's all these Antilles. Now, some of these uh, places are, are, you know, still Dutch. Some of them are French. Um some of them, you know, they. Some of them, they speak, you know, Spanish because they were Spanish colonies. Um, 
you know, they, they speak different languages on these different islands based on how they were colonized hundreds of years right. ago. So you have the Netherlands Antilles, you have the French Antilles, and there's all these different islands. You know, St. Martin mm -hmm. is uh, uh, cut in half, so it's half Dutch and half French. Um, so it's St. Martin and St. Martin. <laughs> so they have. Yeah, I've been there. I was there on a cruise. I remember that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And same with the uh, Dominican Republic. Uh, you have the French side and the uh, Spanish side. Uh, mm -hmm. Stuff like that. So, um, and it goes all the way down. I think. Well, then you get Aruba. Is right near Venezuela, where there was supposedly a lot of child trafficking gone with the Sean Penn angle. We won't get into that right now, but under Hugo Chavez, there was a lot of this going on in Venezuela. Uh, and then you have John Agon in Brazil trafficking children. So there's a lot going on in South America. You got Nazis in South America. All right. But I want to go back to Canada because uh, the Jarecki family is also connected to the uh, Frank Justra, who was with Lionsgate Films, because uh, Andrew has three other brothers. He has Nicholas, he has Eugene, uh, who's the third one? Uh, I think Nicholas, yeah, I, I don't have my computer up, but basically uh, one's a one's a financier and the other two are filmmakers too, and they're all connected to Lionsgate. And this Frank Giustra character, who's also down with the Clinton Foundation, and his wife owns all these charities, and um, uh, he's all caught up in Uranium One because he has all these mining operations. Right. So that gets pretty deep right there. So basically, the Jureckis are like you know one step removed from the Clintons at the top level, right. and that makes Ar right. Arnold Friedman only two steps removed. So the other hypothesis was that these kids were sitting on, if there were child porn being produced by the by Arnold Friedman, the father, the kids were sitting on all those tapes or knew where all those tapes were, and if the tapes contained incriminating evidence against the Jureckis the sons would have contacted the Jarekis and said, we have these tapes that can bring you down. Help us get our son out of jail. Help us clear our father's name. Right. So the question wow. is, did the Freedman kids know the Jarecki kids prior to the, pro prior to the film being produced? Were they acquainted right. with each other and somehow did they have any contact with each other? And you'll see that the Jarecki uh, f patriarch, Henry Jarecki, is based in Rye, New York. Okay, so that's right across the sound from Great Neck. Yeah, I know, I know where Rye is. I've been to Rye Playland many times. Right, and that's the thing is that, you know, Rye, New York is a very interesting place because it's right on the border of New York and Connecticut, and it was part of a dispute between New York and Connecticut. The state line got moved over there. And, um, that's why there's that weird little border. It makes this weird little. Um, if you look at it, it doesn't. It, it looks weird uh, the way the border between New York and Connecticut. There was a an adjustment made, and uh, okay. and there's um there's the town of Rye, and then there's something called Rye Center, I think. There's a little part. Okay. There's a little part of Rye that's not in Rye. It's like in the middle of another town, right next to it. I think it's called Rye Center, which, okay. is, which is very strange. And you know, he lives in Rye. There's a bunch of other people. Uh, at least one other billionaire lives in Rye. It, it seems to be another spot. Years ago, like back in the '60s or something, where billionaires hung out, and probably it was because Rye Playland was a place to be to get a, to get at kids, and where you can take kids and traffic them say I'm taking your kid to Rye for the day yeah and then they'd be yeah. trafficked to the billionaires right next door and then go back right and you know yeah um, yeah and um, there's you know there's a couple of other places like like um, like down in your, your hometown Whitestone there was a place called Adventures Inn do you remember? Adventures Inn. I don't remember that. 
Well, what's the what's the name of that mall that's right along the uh, Van Wick Whitestone Expressway? There's a little mall down there on the corner of Queens. Right. A mall? Look at a little. Uh, oh, 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 big song. one. Um, the A and S, like A and S, that one. No, it's across from um, where the New York Times has their printing. Um, I don't remember. I just don't remember. Yeah, but there's basically a shopping center there. It has an arcade. But across where... where the, uh, oh, yeah, with the arcade. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I remember. Yeah, yeah, with the arcade. Yeah, okay. Do you know what's yeah, called? Yeah, it sounds so familiar. The Adventures, in, the Adventures in was the arcade, right? Oh, way back when. Yeah, it's on the other side. Back on the flushing side of it. Of the highway. I faintly remember that, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> it had a big slide where you would go down on a blanket and get these, like, friction burns. <clears throat> well, I don't remember that. All right, well, go ahead. I'm not sure. It's just another place, like Rye Playland, that was right there in your uh, in your neck of the woods. And it was called Adventures Inn, and it was, it was just a creepy vibe about it. And right. um, it, um, now, uh, right next to... The, the, it's closed. It's been... It just got torn down, but right next to that site is where the New York Times has its printing plant. I see. So it's we weird know that the, the, New York Times, <laughs> the satanic involved. the satanic New York Times would be printing their infernal paper right next to Adventures in, you know. Yeah. But that was all, you know, that all that area was kind of creepy. They had all those um, scrapyards and, um, you know. It was a place where you would junk your car. They would just crush it on the spot. And it was just all polluted with antifreeze. The Flushing Bay was all green with chemicals. Right near, you know, right behind LaGuardia Airport there. It was just the most polluted, godforsaken place you could ever imagine. Right. <laughs> Anyways, um, so th that's pretty much all I had was that, you know, there's a Jarecki connection to the Epstein's through the little black book they own islands no one's discussed it i think i'm the first person so you know there needs to be uh you know a map put together with, with all these islands and who they are because the nexium people they have an island out in fiji they have a private island the bronfmans and the nexium people had an island out way out in fiji and you know when, when you start to look at fiji there's celebrities out there and that was an old cannibal island um, way back when and that's where like wow. Marlon Brando set up shop and he had a bunch of weird mur murders in his family right one of his uh, sons died there or there, there was just some kind of very weird stories of pe people in his family dying. I, I don't remember the details but there's a whole creepy Marlon Brando thing going on out in Fiji and then you you see these Bronfmans out there so you know, you put someone on an island, yeah. they're stuck there. They can't get off. You don't even have to, like, chain them up. Right, right. Oh, yeah, and then there's that. There's these two little uh, things that stick in your mind from the 70s. <coughs> and that's um, Fantasy Island. There was a TV show called Fantasy Island, and there was this suave kind of uh, owner of the island named Mr. Rourke and it was, he was played by Ricardo Bantablam and, the, and he had a midget butler assistant named um, uh, Tattoo was his name Tattoo? and uh, he was played by Hervé Villachez this uh, French actor this midget actor who <laughs> was this little froggy ugly kind of guy who couldn't talk to good English. He was like, look boss, the plane, the plane. <laughs> you don't know any of my fantasy islands? I haven't seen it, now. It was on for years, like in the late 70s. I never watched it. Yeah. And, uh, I the, was the born in 77. I, the yeah. whole story was that, you know, you'd watch it like on a Friday night on like ABC or whatever. I forgot what network it was. It was on a major network in prime time uh, on a weekend. Uh, and these people would fly out to this island and they'd pay $50,000 to have their fantasy fulfilled. And they would wow. have all this acting and psychodrama for whatever it is. And as they got off the plane of this little uh, Cessna onto the dock, 
Rourke would be explaining to the midget what their story is and what they're here for, you know. But apparently, no matter what your fantasy was, they would fulfill it for $50,000. So you can, um, now why is, you know, yeah. network television producing a show like that in the late set? What do they know that we don't know? I mean, the thing looks very suspicious because Mr. Rourke, when you look at it, how he dresses and how he presents himself, he's Jeffrey Epstein. I see. I see. So they knew. So they've always known. Well, Jeffrey Epstein didn't buy his island until like the 90s. So there was someone before Jeffrey Epstein. So there's a type of person who run, who, who um, uh, um, hosts these islands. He's a concierge. He's, um, you know, it's almost like the guy from Borat, right? I forget his name. Uh, Sasha. Oh, Sasha. Sasha Baron Cohen, he he, yeah, he was yeah. in Vegas and he was trying to do like a gag a gag stunt video, and he went to the concierge in some hotel in Vegas, and he asked you know hey I'm I'm looking for a little kid, the diddle, and the guy was like okay, <laughs> and he said yeah, right. <laughs> I'll get you wow, and uh you know that kind of these stories just fall through the cracks in network news they don't you know they just. <laughs> Harping on Russia. Oh yeah, well there's there's a there's an effort of us, as we all know to cover all that up. Anything that would connect it, you know. Well, the funny thing is that before Fantasy Island was a, was a series, there was a James Bond movie called. Um, let's see, what was the name of the movie? Uh, the Spy Who Loved Me. Oh yeah. And that was um, the most noteworthy. Um, thing from that movie was the theme song became a top 40 hit on the radio I forgot was it Carly Simon who sang it or I don't know it, it was just one of those yeah late 70s hits on the radio but uh, in the movie they wind up um, on some um, island off of China like a fantasy island and he's the, I'm sorry, it's not the spy I love me. It was the man with the golden gun. That's right. Man with the golden okay. gun. And he, the man with the golden gun, is his name is Mr. Scaramanga. He's a villain. But he looks just like Mr. Rourke. He has the same accent. He has the same white suit. And he's got the same highfalutin kind of dapper look. And he's got the right. same midget butler. He's got this Hervé Villachez as his butler. And I think he, he has a different name. If it's tattoo or knickknack or whatever his name was, right? He's the sidekick of this uh, white suited villain, and um, so it's this beautiful island. Um, I think it's in the movie. It's supposed to be off China, so you would think it was Macau, but the actual location was off of Thailand. There are islands that look like that. These like things that jut out of the water and really tall, kind of like Devil's Tower. These beautiful islands. Yeah. So James Bond lands his Cessna on the island, and uh, uh, Scaramanga later blows it up with his solar-powered laser tower thing. There's just like there's like a solar-powered laser on there. I don't know what, but yeah, all these islands have, you know, and all these Bond movies they have these sophisticated facilities hidden in the mountain, you know, in a cave or under the ground. Yeah. You know, there's always something, and they're talking about this back in the 70s, that there are these, like, really high-tech facilities built into these exotic places. Uh, and it might have been, you know, not far off from the truth. Uh, so anyways, yeah. yeah, there's this, so you have, you know, these two islands in, in, in uh, predictive programming, popular culture, and they, so he got the island in the James Bond movie, The Man with the Golden Gun. There's just so much in that movie, uh, in, in that le that era of Bond movies that reeks of Jeffrey Epstein type activities, you know, without mentioning it. But there's always like these girls around, you know, they're all throwing themselves at James Bond all the time. They're all in bikinis or they're trapped with the villain and he keeps them as, you know, pets. And it's just this weird stuff and they're normalizing all this stuff. Um, right, the predictive programming, yeah. So it became almost this thing in the back of your head, the midget butler, if you were like some kind of billionaire Jeffrey Epstein type, like 
the ultimate status symbol would be to have a midget butler. So over the years, I've, um, I've come to the interpretation that these midget butlers are metaphors for children. Oh, yeah. Okay. That and, makes sense. And yep. that goes back to the Wizard of Oz. There's just like thousands, oh, and thousands of these midgets. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like, yeah, why, I never thought of that. Yeah, you're right. Why would you put midgets? Like, why? What's the point of the midget, right? Yeah. I mean, it's like, oh, I've yeah, got an idea, we got, this, we got this great story, and let's just put a bunch of midgets in there. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't even make sense unless you're looking at it from that angle. Like, why? Like, why would they come up with that? Yeah, you're right. I agree. Right, and why is there a midget butler on, uh, you know, <laughs> the, uh, Fantasy Island that... <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine, like, the guest is getting off the plane one weekend, <coughs> and the tattoo is ringing the bell up in the cupola, look, boss, the plane, the plane, and he runs down with his little short legs, and Mr. Rourke comes out the front door, and he goes, oh, it's the plane, it's the plane, <laughs> and they go over to the lagoon, and there's a dock, and the Cessna's pulling up, and Mr. Rourke says, well, well tattoo, <laughs> this this weekend we have billionaire Jeffrey Epstein and his fantasy.